Chapter 16 of The People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Misunderstandings. For some days after the acrimonious conversation that has been reported, the relations between Leonard and Juana were not a little strained, although the necessity of travel brought them into continual contact. Both felt that they had cause of complaint against the other, and both were at heart somewhat ashamed of the part which they had played. Leonard regretted ever having made the agreement with Soa, and Juana, now that she had cooled down a little, regretted having spoken as she did upon the subject. Her pride was offended, but after all, how could he know? Besides, he was an adventurer, and it was natural that he should make terms. Doubtless also his anxiety to win fortune had to do with the lady whose name was written in the prayer book. Perhaps this lady was only a maiden aunt, but a great desire seized Juana to know about her, and when such a wish enters the heart of woman it is probable that she will find a means to satisfy it. Having no one else to ask, Juana sounded Otter with whom she was on friendly terms, only to find that the subject of Jane Beach did not interest the dwarf. He hazarded a remark, however, that doubtless she was one of the boss's wives when he lived in his big corral over the water. This disgusted Juana somewhat, but the allusion to a big corral excited the curiosity of which she had a certain share, and very adroitly she questioned the dwarf concerning it. He rose to the fly without hesitation, and told her that his master had been one of the greatest men in the world, and one of the richest, but that he had lost his possessions through the wicked arts of foemen, and was come to this country to seek new ones. Indeed Otter enlarged upon the theme, and anxious to extol his beloved chief's worth in the eyes of the shepherdess, it would not be too much to say that he drew upon his own imagination. Leonard, he declared, had owned country as wide as a horse could gallop across in a day. Moreover, he had two hundred tribesmen, heads of families, who fed upon oxen killed for them, twenty oxen a week, and ten principal wives had called him husband. Juana asked for the titles of the wives, whereon the undefeated otter gave them all Kaffir names, not neglecting to describe their lineage, personal charms, and the number and sex of their children. The tale took about two hours to tell, and after hearing it, Juana conceived a great respect for Otter, but she saw clearly that if she wished for reliable information, she must obtain it from Leonard himself. It was not till the last day of their journey that Juana found the opportunity she sought. The voyage had been most prosperous, and they expected to reach the ruined settlement on the morrow, though whether or not they would find Mr. Rood there was a matter of anxious conjecture, especially to his daughter. Day after day they rode and sailed up the great river. Camping at night upon its banks, which would have been pleasant had it not been for the mosquitoes. But all this while Leonard and Juana saw little of each other, though they met often enough. On this particular occasion, however, it chanced that they were journeying in the same boat alone, except for the rowers. Possibly Juana had contrived that it should be so, for as a general rule, in pursuit of his policy of avoiding a disagreeable young person, Leonard traveled with Otter in the first boat, while Juana was accompanied by Francisco and Soa in the second. To the priest, indeed, she made herself very agreeable, perhaps to show Leonard how charming she could be when she chose. She conversed with him by the hour together, as though he were a woman friend, and his melancholy eyes would lighten with pleasure at her talk. Indeed, Francisco had something of the feminine in his nature. His very gentleness was womanly and his slight stature, delicate hands, and features heightened 
this impression. In face, he was not unlike Juana herself, and as time went on, the resemblance seemed to grow. Had he been arrayed in a woman's loose attire, it would have been easy to mistake one for the other in the dusk, although she was the taller of the two. The accident of his profession caused Juana to admit Francisco to an intimacy which she would have withheld from any other man. She forgot, or did not understand, that she was playing a dangerous game, that after all he was a man, and that the heart of a man beat beneath his cassock. Nobody could be more charming in her manner or more subtle in her mind than Juana. Yet day after day she did not hesitate to display all her strength before the unfortunate young priest, which, in addition to her beauty, made her somewhat irresistible, at any rate on the Zambezi. Friendship and ignorance of the world were doubtless at the bottom of this reprehensible conduct. But it is also possible that unconscious pick had something to do with it. She was determined to show Leonard that she was not always a disagreeable person whom it was well to avoid, or at least that others did not think so. That all these airs and graces might have a tragic effect upon Francisco never occurred to her till too late. Well, for once, the order of things was changed. Leonard and Juana sat side by side in the first boat. The evening was lovely. They guided slowly by the reed-fringed bank, watching the long lights play upon the surface of the lonely river, listening to the whistling wings of the countless wildfowl overhead, and counting the herds of various game that roamed upon the plains beyond. For a while neither of them spoke much. Occasionally Juana would call her companion's attention to some water flower or to a great fish darting from the oars, and he would answer by a word or nod. His heart was wroth with the girl. As Otter would have said, he wondered why she had come with him. Because she was tired of the priest, perhaps? He wished her away, and yet he would have been sorry enough had she gone. For her part, Juana desired to make him speak, and did not know how to break through his moody silence. Suddenly she leaned back in the boat and began to sing in a rich contralto voice that moved him. He had never heard her sing before, had never heard any good singing for many years indeed, and he was fond of singing. The song she sang was a Portuguese love song, very tender and passionate, addressed by a bereaved lover to his dead mistress, and she put much expression into it. Presently she ceased, and he noticed that her beautiful eyes were full of tears, so she could feel. That is too sad, she said with a little laugh, and then burst into a Kaffir boat song, of which the settlement natives, joyous in the prospect of once more seeing their home, took up the chorus gleefully. Presently, she wearied of the boat chant. I am tiring you, she said. I dare say that you do not care for singing. On the contrary, Miss Rood, I am very fond of it. Your voice is good, if you will allow me to say so, and it has been trained. I do not quite understand how you can have the opportunity to learn so many things, music, for instance. I suppose, Mr. Outram, you think that I should be a sort of savage by rights, but as a matter of fact, although we have lived on the Zambezi, I have had some chances. There is always a certain amount of trade on the river, by means of which we often obtain books and other things, and are brought into occasional contact with European merchants, travelers, and missionaries. Then my father is a gently born and well-educated man, though circumstances have caused him to spend his life in these wild places. He was a scholar in his days, and he taught me a good deal, and I have picked up more by reading. Also, for nearly three years, I was at a good school in Durban and did my best to improve myself there. I did not wish to grow up wild because 
I lived among wild people. Indeed, that explains the miracle. And do you like living among savages? I have liked it well enough hitherto, but this last adventure has sickened me. Oh, it was dreadful. Had I not been very strong, I could never have endured it. A nervous woman would have been driven mad. Yes, I have liked it well enough. I have always looked upon it as a preparation for life. I think that the society of nature is the best education for the society of man. Since until you understand and are in sympathy with the one, you cannot really understand the other. Now I should like to go to Europe and see the world and its civilizations, for I know from what stuff they were evolved. But perhaps I never shall, at any rate. I have to find my dear father first, and she sighed. Leonard made no answer. He was thinking. And you, Mr. Ottram, do you care for this life? I, he exclaimed bitterly, like yourself, Miss Rood, I am the victim of circumstance and must make the best of them. As I told you, I am a penniless adventurer, seeking my fortune in the rough places of the earth. Of course I might earn a livelihood in England, but that is of no use to me. I must win wealth and a great deal of it. What is the good, she said. Is there any object in wearing out one's life by trying to grow rich? That depends. I have an object, one which I have sworn to fulfill. She looked at him inquiringly. Miss Rood, I will tell you. My brother, who died of fever some weeks ago, and I were the last male survivors of a very ancient house. We were born to great prospects, or at least he was, but owing to the conduct of our father, everything was lost to us, and the old house, which had been ours for centuries, went to the hammer. That was seven years ago, when I was a man of three and twenty. We swore that we would try to retrieve those fortunes, not for ourselves so much, but for the sake of the family, and came to Africa to do it. My brother is dead, but I inherit the oath and continue the quest however hopeless it may be, and now perhaps you will understand why I signed a certain document. Yes, she said, I understand now. It is a strange history, but tell me, have you no relations left? One, I believe, if she still lives, a maiden aunt, my mother's sister. Is she Jane Beach? she asked quickly. Forgive me, but I saw that name in the prayer book. No, he said, she is not Jane Beach. Juana hesitated. Then curiosity and perhaps other feelings overcame her, and she asked straight out, Who is Jane Beach? Leonard looked at Juana and remembered all that he had suffered at her hands. It was impertinent of her to ask such a question, but since she chose to do so, she should have an answer. Doubtless, she supposed that he was in love with herself. Doubtless, her conduct was premeditated and aimed at the repression of his hopes. He would show her that there were other women in the world, and that one of them, at any rate, had not thought so poorly of him. It was foolish conduct on his part, but then people suffering under unmerited snubs, neglect, and mockery at the hands of a lady they admire are apt to lose their judgment and do foolish things. So he answered. Jane Beach is the lady to whom I was engaged. I guessed it, she replied, with a smile and a shiver. I guessed it when I saw that you always carried the prayer book about with you. You forget, Miss Rood, that the prayer book contains an agreement which might become valuable. Juana took no heed of his sarcasm. She was too intent on other thoughts. Are you engaged to her now? No, I suppose not. Her father broke off the match when we lost our fortunes. She must have been very sorry. Yes, she was very sorry. How interesting. You must not think me curious, Mr. Ottram, but I have never come across a love affair, that is, a white love affair, out of a novel. Of course, 
She often writes to you? I have never heard from her since I left England. Indeed, surely she must have written or sent a message. I suppose that her father forbade it, Leonard answered, but in his heart he also thought that Jane might have written or sent a message, and could well guess why none had come. Ah, her father, tell me, was she very beautiful? She was the loveliest woman that I ever saw, except one who is sitting at my side, he added to himself. And do you love her very much? Yes, I loved her very much. If Juana had heard the change of tense, she took no note of it. It was such a little thing, only one letter, and yet what a vast gulf there is between love and loved. It is measureless. Still, most people have crossed it in their lives, some of them more than once. He told her the exact truth, but after a woman's fashion she added to the truth. He said that he had loved Jane Beach, and she did not doubt that he still loved her more than ever. How was she to know that the image of this far away and hateful Jane was fading from his mind, to be replaced by that of a certain present Juana? She took it all for granted and filled in the details with a liberal hand and in high colors. Juana took it all for granted. Again she shivered and her lips turned gray with pain. She understood now that she had loved him ever since the night when they first met in the slave camp. It was her love, as yet unrecognized, which, transforming her, had caused her to behave so badly. It had been dreadful to her to think that she should be thrust upon this man in a mock marriage. It was worse to know that he had entered on her rescue not for her own sake, but in the hope of winning wealth. In the moment of her loss, Juana learned for the first time what she had gained. She had played and lost, and she could never throw those dice again. It was begun and finished. So Juana thought and felt. A little more experience of the world might have taught her differently, but she had no experience, and in such novels as she had read, the hero seldom varied in the pursuit of his first love or turned to look upon another. Ah, if all heroes and heroines acted up to this golden rule, what an uncommonly dull world it would be. Juana gathered her energies and spoke in a low, steady voice. Mr. Ottram, she said, I am so much obliged to you for telling me all this. It interests me a great deal, and I earnestly hope that Soa's tale of treasure will turn out to be true, and that you may win it by my help. It will be some slight return for all that you have done for me. Yes, I hope that you will win it and buy back your home, and after your years of toil and danger, live there in honor and happiness and love, as you deserve to do. And now I ask you to forgive me my behavior, my rudeness, and my bitter speeches. It has been shameful, I know. Perhaps you will make some excuse for me when you remember all that I have gone through. My nerves were shaken. I was not myself. I acted like a half-wild minx. There, that is all. As she spoke, Juana began to draw the signet ring from her left hand. But she never completed the act. It was his gift to her, the only outward link between her and the man whom she had lost. Why should she part with it? It reminded her of so much. She knew now that this mock marriage was in sense a true one, that is, so far as she was concerned, for from that hour she had indeed given her spirit into his keeping, not herself, but her better half and her love. And those solemn words over her in that dreadful place and time had consecrated the gift. It was nothing, it meant nothing, yet on her it should be binding, though not on him. Yes, all her life she would remain as true to him in mind and act as though she had indeed become his wife on that night of fear. To do so would be her only happiness. She thought, though it is strange, 
that in her sorrow she should turn for comfort to this very event, the mere mention of which had moved her to scorn and bitterness. But so it was, and so let it be. Leonard saw the look upon her face. He had never seen anything quite like it before. With astonishment he heard her gentle words, and something of the meaning of the look and words came home to him. At any rate, he understood that she was suffering. She was changed in his sight. He no longer felt bitter towards her. He loved her. Might it not be that she also loved him, and that here was the key to her strange conduct? Once and for all he would settle the matter. He would tell her that Jane Beach had ceased to be more than a tender memory to him, and that she had become all. Juana, he said, addressing her by her Christian name for the first time. But there, as it was fated, the sentence began and ended, for at that moment a canoe shot alongside of them, and Francisco's voice was heard hailing them through the fog. Peter says that you have passed the camping place, Senora. He did not stop you because he thought that you knew it well. It was the mist, father, Juana answered, with a little laugh. We have lost ourselves in a mist. A few minutes, and they were on the bank, and Leonard's declaration remained unspoken. Nor did he make any attempt to renew it. It seemed to him that Juana had built a wall between them which he could not climb. From that evening forward, her whole attitude towards him changed. She no longer angered him by bitter words. Indeed, she was gentleness itself, and nothing could be kinder or more friendly and open than her manner. But there it began and ended. Once or twice, indeed, he attempted some small advance, with the result that instantly she seemed to freeze, to become cold and hard as marble. He could not understand her. He feared her somewhat, and his pride took alarm. At least he could keep his feelings to himself. He need not expose them to be trampled upon by this incomprehensible girl. So although they were destined to live side by side for months, rarely out of each other's sight or thoughts, he went his way and she went hers. But the past and secret trouble left its mark on both. Leonard became sterner, more silent, watchful, and suspicious. Juana grew suddenly from a girl into a woman of presence and great natural dignity. She did not often laugh during those months, as had been her wont. She only smiled, sadly enough at times. Her thoughts would not let her laugh, for they were of what her life might have been, had no such person as Jane Beach existed and of what it must be because of Jane Beach. Indeed, this unknown Jane took a great hold of her mind. She haunted her. Juana pictured her in a dozen different shapes of beauty, endowed with many varying charms, and hated each phantasm worse than the last. Still for a while she would set it up as a rival, and try to outmatch its particular fancied graces or loveliness. A strange form of jealousy, at which length led Otter to remark that the shepherdess was not one woman, but twenty women, and therefore bewitched and to be avoided. But these fits only took her from time to time. For the most part, she moved among them a grave and somewhat stately young lady, careful of many things, fresh and lovely to look upon, a mystery to her white companions, and to the natives little short of a goddess. But wherever Juana moved, two shadows went with her, her secret passion, and the variable image of that far-off English lady who had robbed her of its fruit. End of chapter 16 Of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Death of Mavoon. One more day's journeying brought the party to the ruined settlement, 
which they found in much the same condition as the Arabs had left it a few weeks before. Fortunately, the destruction was not nearly so great as it appeared. The inside of the house, indeed, was burnt out, but its walls still remained intact, and many of the huts of the natives were still standing. Messengers who left the canoes at dawn had spread the news of the rescue and return of the shepherdess among the people of the neighboring corrals, who flocked by scores to the landing place. With these were at least a hundred of Mr. Rood's own people, who had escaped the clutches of the slave traders by hiding, absence, and various other accidents, and now returned to greet his daughter and their own relatives as they would have greeted one risen from the grave. Indeed, the welcome accorded to Juana was most touching. Men, women, and children ran to her, the men saluting her with guttural voices and uplifted arms, the women and children gesticulating, chattering, and kissing her dress and hand. Waving them aside impatiently, Juana asked the men if anything had been seen or heard of her father. They answered no. Some of their number had started up the river to search for him on the same day when she was captured, but they had not returned, and no tidings had come from them or him. Do not be alarmed, said Leonard, seeing the distress and anxiety written on her face. Doubtless he has gone further than he anticipated, and the men have not been able to find him. I fear that something has happened to him, she answered. He should have been back by now. He promised to return within the fortnight. By this time the story of the capture and destruction of the slave camp was spread abroad among the people by the rescued men, and the excitement rose to its height. Otter, seeing a favorable opportunity to trumpet his master's fame, swaggered to and fro through the crowd, shaking a spear and chanting Leonard's praises, after the Zulu fashion. Wow, he said, wow, look at him, ye people, and be astonished. Look at him, the white elephant, and hear his deeds. In the night he fell upon them. He fell upon them, the armed men, in a fenced place. He did it alone. No one helped him but a black monkey and a woman with a shaking hand. He beguiled them with a tongue of honey. He smote them with a spear of iron. He won the shepherdess from the midst of them to be a wife to him. He satisfied the yellow devil. He satisfied him with gold. The praying man prayed over them. Then strife arose. Their greatest warrior gave him battle. He broke him with his fist. Then the monkey played his tricks, and the shaking hand made a great noise, a noise of thunder. They fell dead. They fell dead in heaps. The fire roared behind them. In front of them, the bullets hailed. They cried like women, but the fire stayed not. It licked up their strength. Ashes are all that is left of them. They are dead, the armed men. No more shall they bring desolation. The day of slavery is gone by. Who did it? He did it. The terrible lion, the black-maned lion with the white face. He gave the slavers to the sword. He doomed their captain to death. He loosened the irons of the captives. Now they shall eat the bread of freedom. Praise him, ye people, who broke the strength of the oppressor. Praise him, the shepherd of the shepherdess, who led her from the house of the wicked. Praise him, ye children of Mavoon, in whose hands are death and life. No such deeds have been told in the land. Praise him, the deliverer, who gives you back your children. Ah, praise him, said Juana, who was standing by. Praise him, children of my father, since but for him none of us would see the light today. At this juncture Leonard himself arrived upon the scene, just in time to hear Juana's words. All the people of the settlement took up the cry, and hundreds of other natives collected there joined in it. They rushed towards him, shouting, Praise to thee, shepherd of the shepherdess, praise to thee, deliverer. Then Leonard, in a fury, caught hold of Otter, 
vowing that if he dared to say another word he would instantly break his neck, and the tumult ceased. But from that day forward he was known among the natives as the Deliverer, and by no other name. That evening as Leonard, Juana, and the priest sat at meat within the walls of the settlement house, with the plunder of the slave camp piled about them, talking anxiously of the fate of Mr. Rood and wondering if anything could be done to discover his whereabouts, they heard a stir among the natives without. At this moment Otter rushed in, crying, Mavoon has come! Instantly they sprang to their feet and ran outside the house, headed by Juana. There, borne on the shoulders of six travel-worn men, and followed by a crowd of natives, they saw a litter upon which lay the figure of a man covered with blankets. "'Oh, he is dead,' said Juana, stopping suddenly and pressing her hands to her heart. For a moment Leonard thought that she was right. Before he could speak, however, they heard a feeble voice calling to the men who carried the litter to be more careful in their movements, and once more Juana sprang forward, crying, Father, Father! Then the bearers brought their burden into the house and set it down upon the floor. Leonard, looking, saw before him a tall and handsome man of about fifty years of age, and saw also, by many unmistakable signs, that he was at the point of death. Juana, gasped her father, is that you? Then you have escaped. Thank God. Now I can die happy. It would serve little purpose to set out in detail the broken conversation which followed, but by degrees Leonard learnt the story. It seemed that Mr. Rood was disappointed in his purpose of purchasing the hoard of ivory which he went out to seek, and unwilling to return empty-handed, pushed on up the river with the hope of obtaining more. In this he failed also, and had just begun his homeward journey when he was met by the party which Soa dispatched, and heard the terrible tidings of the abduction of his daughter by Perita. It was nightfall when the messengers arrived, and too dark to travel. For a while Mr. Rood sat brooding over the news of this crushing disaster, perhaps the most fearful that could come to a father's ears. Then he did what he was but prone to do, flew for refuge to the bottle. When he had drunk enough to destroy his judgment, he rose and insisted upon continuing their march through the inky darkness of the night. In vain did the men remonstrate, saying that the road was rocky and full of danger. He would take no denial. Indeed, he vowed that if they refused to come, he would shoot them. So they started, Mr. Rood leading the way, while his people stumbled after him through trees and over rocks as best they might. The march was not a long one, however, for presently the men heard an oath and a crash, and their master vanished, nor could they find him till the dawn came to give them light. Then they discovered that they had halted upon the edge of a small but precipitous cliff, and at the bottom of the donga beneath lay Mavoon, not dead, indeed, but senseless, and with three ribs and his right ankle broken. For some days they nursed him there, till at length he decided upon being carried forward in a litter. So notwithstanding his sufferings, which were intense, they bore him homewards by short stages, till ultimately they reached the settlement. That night Leonard examined Mr. Rood's injuries, and found that they were fatal. Indeed, mortification had already set in about the region of the broken ribs. Still, he lived a while. On the following morning the dying man sent for Leonard. Entering the room, he found him lying on the floor, his head supported in his daughter's lap, while the priest Francisco prayed beside him. He suffered no pain now, for when mortification begins, pain passes, and his mind was quite clear. Mr. Altram, he said, I have learnt all the story of the taking of the slave camp and your rescue of my daughter. It was the pluckiest thing that I ever heard of. I only wish that I had been there to help in it. 
"'Don't speak of it,' said Leonard. "'Perhaps you have heard also that I did it for a consideration.' "'Yes, they told me that, too, and small blame to you. "'If only that old fool Soa had let me into the secret of those rubies, "'I would have had a try for them years ago, "'as, of course, you will when I am gone. "'Well, I hope that you may get them, "'but I have no time to talk of rubies, "'for death has caught me at last.' through my own fault, as usual. If you ever take a drop, Altram, be warned by me and give it up. But you don't look as if you did. You look as I used to, before I learnt to tackle a bottle of rum at a sitting. Now listen, comrade, I am in a hole, not about myself, for that must have come sooner or later, and it does not much matter when the world is rid of a useless fellow like me. But about my girl here, what is to become of her? I have not got a cent. Those cursed slavers have cleared me out, and she has no friend. How should she have, when I have been thirty years away from England? Look here, I am going to do the only thing I can. I am going to leave my daughter in your charge, though it is rough on you. And as you deal with her, so may heaven deal with you. I understand that there was some ceremony of marriage between you down yonder. I don't know how you take that, either of you, or how far the matter will go when I am dead. But if it goes any way at all, I trust your honor as an English gentleman to repeat that ceremony the first time you come to a civilized country. If you do not care for each other, however, then Juana must shift as other women have to do, poor things. She can look after herself, and I suppose that her face will help her to a husband sometime. There is one thing, though. She hasn't a pound. She is the best girl that ever stepped, and of as good blood as you can be. There is no older family than the Roods in Lincolnshire, and she is the last of them that I know of. Also, her mother was well-born, although she was a Portuguese. And now, do you accept the trust? I would gladly, answered Leonard, but how can I? I propose to go after these rubies. Would it not be better that Father Francisco here should take your daughter to the coast? I have a little money which is at her disposal. No, answered the dying man with energy. I will only trust her to you. If you want to search for these rubies, and you would be a fool not to, she must accompany you. That is all. I know that you will look after her, and if the worst comes to the worst, she has a medicine to protect herself with, the same that she so nearly used in the slave camp. Now, what do you say? Leonard thought for a moment, while the dying man watched his face anxiously. It is a heavy responsibility, he said, and the circumstances make it an awkward one, but I accept it. I will take care of her as though she were my wife or my daughter. Thank you for that, answered Rude. I believe you, and as to the relationship, you will settle that for yourselves. And now good-bye. I like you. I wish we had known one another before I got into trouble at home, became a Zambezi trader and a drunkard. Leonard took the hand which Mr. Rude lifted with a visible effort, and when he released it, it fell heavily like the hand of a dead man. Then as he turned to go, he glanced at Juana's face, but could make nothing of it, for it was as the face of a sphinx. There the girl sat, her back resting against the wall, her dying father's head pillowed upon her knee, motionless as if carved in stone. She was staring straight before her with eyes wide open and curved lips set apart, as though she were about to speak, and suddenly had been stricken to silence. So still was she that Leonard could scarcely note any movement of her breast. Even her eyelids had ceased to quiver, and the very pallor of her face seemed fixed like that of a waxen image. He wondered what she was thinking of. But even had she been willing to bear her thoughts to him, it is doubtful whether she could have made them intelligible. 
Her mind was confused, but two things struggled, one against the other within it. It was the sense of loss and the sense of shame. The father whom, notwithstanding his faults, she loved dearly, who indeed had been her companion, her teacher, her playmate, and her friend, the dearest she had known, lay dying before her eyes, and, with his last breath, had consigned her to the care of a man whom she loved, and from whom, as she believed, she was forever separated. Would there, then, be no end to the obligations under which she labored at the hands of this stranger? who had suddenly taken possession of her life, and what fate was on her that she should thus be forced into false positions, whence there was no escape. Did she wish to escape even? Juana knew not, but as she sat there, with a finx-like face, trouble and doubt, and many other fear and feeling, took so firm a hold of her, that at length her mind, bewildered with its own tumult, lost its grip of present realities, and sought refuge in dreams which he could not disentangle. No wonder, then, that Leonard failed to guess her thoughts as she watched him go from the deathbed. Mr. Rood died peacefully that evening, and on the following afternoon they buried him, Francisco performing the service. Three more days passed before Leonard had any conversation with Juana who moved about the place, pale, self-contained, and silent. Nor would he have spoken to her then, had she not taken the initiative. Mr. Ockram, she said, when do you propose to start upon this journey? Really, I do not know. I am not sure that I shall start at all. It depends upon you. You see, I am responsible for you now, and I can scarcely reconcile it with my conscience to take you on such a wild goose chase. Please do not talk like that, she answered. If it will simplify matters, I may as well tell you at once that I have made up my mind to go. You cannot unless I go, he answered, smiling. You are wrong there, Juana, replied defiantly. I can, and what is more, I will, and Soa will guide me. It is you who cannot go without me, that is, if Soa tells the truth. For good or evil, we are yoked together in this matter, Mr. Ottram, so it is useless for us to try to pull different ways. Before he died, my father told you his views plainly, and even if there were no other considerations involved, such as that of the agreement, for whatever you may think to the contrary, women have some sense of honor, Mr. Ottram. I would not disregard his wishes. Beside, what else are we to do? We are both adventurers now, and both penniless, or pretty nearly so. Perhaps if we succeed in finding this treasure, and it is sufficiently large, you will be generous and give me a share of it, say five per cent, on which to support my declining years. And she turned and left him. Beginning to show temper again, said Leonard to himself, I will ask Francisco what he thinks of it. Of late, things had gone a little better between Leonard and the priest, not that the former had as yet any complete confidence in the latter. Still, he understood now that Francisco was a man of honest mind and gentle instincts, and naturally in this dilemma he turned to seek for counsel to his only white companion. Francisco listened to the story quietly. Indeed, for the most part, it was already known to him. Well, he said, when Leonard had finished, I suppose that you must go. The Senora Juana is not a young lady to change her mind when once she has made it up. And if you were to refuse to start, mark my words, she would make the expedition by herself, or try to do so. As to this story of treasure and the possibility of winning it, I can only say that it seems strange enough to be true, and that the undertaking is so impractical that it will probably be successfully accomplished. Hum, said Leonard, sounds like a paradoxical, but after that slave camp business, like you, I am inclined to believe in paradoxes. And now, father, 
What do you propose to do? I, to accompany you, of course, if you will allow me, I am a priest and will play the part of chaperone, if I can do nothing else, he added with a smile. Leonard whistled and asked, Why on earth do you mix yourself up in such a doubtful business? You have all your life before you. You are able and may make a career for yourself in religion. There is nothing for you to gain by this journey. On the contrary, it may bring you death, or he added, with meaning, sorrow, which cannot be forgotten. My life and death are in the hands of God, the priest answered humbly. He appointed the beginning, and he will appoint the end. As for that sorrow which cannot be forgotten, what if it is already with me? And he touched his breast and looked up. The eyes of the two men met, and they understood each other. Why don't you go away and try to forget her, said Leonard. The speech was blunt, but Francisco did not resent it. I do not go, he answered, because it would be useless. So far as I am concerned, the mischief is done. For her there is none to fear. While I stay, it is possible that I may be able to do her some service, feeble as I am. I have sinned a great sin, but she does not know, and will never know it while I live. For you are a man of honor, and will tell her nothing, and she has no eyes to see. What am I to her? I am a priest, no man. I am like a woman, friend, and as such she is fond of me. No, I have sinned against heaven, against myself, and her, and you. Alas, who could help it? She was like an angel in that inferno, so kind, so sweet, so lovely, and the heart is evil. Why do you say that you've sinned against me, Francisco? As to the rules of your church, I have my own opinion of them. Still, there they are, and perhaps they prick your conscience. But what harm have you done to me? I told you, he answered, on the second night after the slave camp was burnt, that I believed you to be man and wife. I believe it yet, and have I not sinned doubly, therefore, in worshipping a woman who is wedded? Still, I pray, that as you are one before heaven and the church, so you may become one in heart and deed. And when this is so, as I think it will be, cherish her, Ottram, for there is no such woman in the world, and for you she will turn the earth to heaven. She might turn it to the other place. Such things have happened, said Leonard moodily. Then he stretched out his arm and grasped the priest's delicate hand. You are a true gentleman, he added, and I am a fool. I saw something of all this, and I suspected you. As for the marriage, there is none, and the lady cares nothing for me. If anything, she dislikes me, and I do not wonder at it. Most women would, under the circumstances. But whatever befalls, I honor you, and always shall honor you. I must go this journey. It is laid on me that I should, and she insists upon going also, more from perversity than for any other reason, I fancy. So, you are coming too. Well, we will do our best to protect her, both of us, and the future must look to itself. Thank you for your words, Francisco answered gently and turned away, understanding that Leonard thought himself his companion in misfortune. When the father had gone, Leonard stood a while, musing upon the curious tangled web in which he found himself involved. Here he was committed to a strange and desperate enterprise. Nor was this all, for about him were other complications, totally different from those which might be expected in connection with such a medieval adventure, complications which, though they are frequent enough in the civilized life of men, were scarcely to be looked for in the wilds of Africa and amidst savages. Among his companions were his ward, who chanced also to be the lady whom he loved and desired to make his wife, but who, as he thought, cared nothing for him, and a priest who was enamored platonically of the same lady, and yet wished, with rare self-sacrifice, to bring about her union with another man. 
Here were materials enough for a romance, leaving the journey and the fabled treasure out of it. Only then the scene should have been laid elsewhere. Leonard laughed aloud as he thought of these things. It was so curious that all this should be heaped upon him at once, so inartistic and yet so like life, in which great events are frequently crowded together without sense of distance or proportion. But even as he laughed, he remembered that this was no joking matter for anybody concerned, unless it were Juana. Alas, already, she was more to him than any treasure, and, as he thought, less attainable. Well, there it was. He accepted it as it stood. She had entered into his life, whether for good or for evil, remained to be seen. He had no desire to repeat the experiment of his youth to wear out his heart and exhaust himself in efforts to attain happiness which might after all turn the wormwood on his lips. This time things should take their chance. The business of life remained to him, and he would follow it, for that is the mission of man. Its happiness must look to itself, for that is the gift of heaven, after which it is useless to seek and to strive. Meantime. He could find time to pity Francisco, the priest with so noble a heart. End of chapter 17 17. Of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Soa Shows Her Teeth Three months had passed since that day when Juana declared her unalterable determination to accompany Leonard upon his search for the treasures of the people of the mist. It was evening, and a party of travelers were encamped on the side of a river that ran through a great and desolate plain. They were a small party, three white people, namely Leonard, Francisco, and Juana, fifteen of the settlement men under the leadership of Peter, the same headsman who had been rescued from the slave camp, and the dwarf otter and Juana's old nurse, Soa. For twelve weeks they had traveled almost without intermission, with Soa for their guide, steering continually northward and westward. First they followed the course of the river in canoes for ten days or more. Then, leaving the main stream, they paddled for three weeks up that of a tributary called Mavue, which ran for many miles along the foot of a great range of mountains named Mang Anja. Here they made but slow progress because of the frequent rapids, which necessitated the portage of their canoes over broken ground and for considerable distances. At length they came to a rapid which was so long and so continuous that regretfully enough they were obliged to abandon the canoes altogether and proceed on foot. The dangers of their water journey had been many, but they were nothing compared to those that now environed them, and in addition to bodily perils they must face the daily and terrible fatigue of long marches through an unknown country, cumbered as they were with arms and other absolutely necessary baggage. The country through which they were now passing was named Maringai, a land uninhabited by man, the home of herds of countless game. On they went northward and upward through a measureless waste. Plain succeeded plain in endless monotony. Distance gave place to distance, and ever there were more beyond. Gradually the climate grew colder. They were traversing a portion of the unexplored plateau that separates southern from central Africa. Its loneliness was awful, and the bearers began to murmur, saying that they had reached the end of the world, and were walking over its edge. Indeed, they had only two comforts in this part of their undertaking. The land lay so high that none of them were stricken by fever, and they could not well miss the road, which if so it was to be believed, ran along the banks of the river 
that had its source in the territories of the people of the mist. The adventures that befell them were endless, but it is not proposed to describe them in detail. Once they had starved for three days, being unable to find game. On another occasion they fell in with a tribe of bushmen who harassed them with poisoned arrows, killing two of their best men, and were only prevented from annihilating them through the terror inspired by their firearms, which they took for magical instruments. Escaping from the bushmen, they entered a forest country which teemed with antelope and also with lions, that by night they must be kept at bay as best they could. Then came several days' march through a plain strewn with sharp stones which lamed most of the party, and after this eighty or a hundred miles of dreary, rolling veldt, clothed with rank grass, just now brown with the winter frosts that caught their feet at every step. Now at length they halted on the boundary of the land of the people of the mist. There before them, not more than a mile away, towered a huge cliff or wall of rock stretching across the plain like a giant step, far as the eye could reach, and varying from seven hundred to a thousand feet in height. Down the surface of this cliff the river flowed in a series of beautiful cascades. Before they had finished their evening meal of buck's flesh, the moon was up, and by its light the three white people stared hopelessly at the frowning natural fortification, wondering if they could climb it, and wondering also what terrors awaited them upon its farther side. They were silent that night, for a great weariness had overcome them, and if the truth must be known, all three of them regretted that they had ever undertaken this mad adventure. Leonard glanced to the right, where, some fifty paces away, the settlement men were crouched round the fire. They also were silent, and it was easy to see that the heart was out of them. "'Won't somebody say something?' said Juana at last with a rather pathetic attempt at playfulness. How could she be so cheerful, poor girl, when her feet were sore and her head was aching and she wished that she were dead, almost? Yes, answered Leonard. I will say that I admire your pluck. I should not have thought it possible for any young lady to have gone through the last two months and come out smiling at the end of them. Well, I'm quite happy. Don't trouble about me, she said laughing as merrily as though there were no such things as sore feet and headaches in the world. Are you, said Leonard, then I envy you, that is all. Here comes old Soa and Otter after her. I wonder what the matter is now. Something disagreeable, I suppose. Soa arrived and squatted down in front of them. Her tall, spare form and somewhat sullen face looking more formidable than usual in the moonlight. Otter was beside her, and though he stood and she sat, their heads were almost on a level. "'What is it, Soa?' said Leonard carelessly. "'Deliverer,' she answered, for all the natives knew him now by this name. Some months ago, when you were digging for gold yonder, in the place of graves, I made a bargain with you, and we set the bargain down on paper. In that paper I promised that if you rescued my mistress I would lead you to the land where precious stones were to be won, and I gave you one of those stones in earnest. You saved my mistress, Mavoon, her father died, and the time came when I must fulfill my promise. For my own part I would not have fulfilled it, for I only made that promise hoping to deceive you, but my mistress yonder refused to listen to me. No, she said, that which you have sworn on my behalf and on your own must be carried out. If you will not carry it out, go away, Soa, for I have done with you. Then deliverer, rather than part with her whom I love and whom I had nursed from a babe, I yielded. And now you stand upon the borders of the country of my people. Say, are you minded to cross them, deliverer? What else did I come for, Soa? he asked. Nay, I know not. 
You came out of the folly of your heart, to satisfy the desire of your heart. Listen, the tale I told you is true, and yet I did not tell you all the truth. Beyond that cliff live a people of great stature, and very fierce, a people whose custom it is to offer up strangers to their gods. Enter there, and they will kill you thus. What do you mean, woman? asked Leonard. I mean that if you hold your life dear, or her life, and she pointed to Juanna, you will turn with the first light and go back whence you came. It is true that the stones are there, but death shall be the reward of him who strives to steal them. I must say this is cheerful, replied Leonard. What did you mean, then, by all that story you told me about a plan that you had to win the treasures of this people? Are you a liar, Soa? I have said all that I told you was true, she answered sullenly. Very well, then. I have come a good many hundreds of miles to put it to the proof, nor am I going to turn back now. You can leave me one and all, if you like, but I shall go on. I will not be made a fool of in this way. None of us have any wish to be made fools of, Mr. Outram, said Juana gently, and speaking for myself. I would rather die at once than attempt a return journey just at present. So now, Soa, perhaps you will stop croaking and tell us definitely what we must do to conciliate these charming countrymen of yours, whom we have come so far to spoil. Remember, she added, with a flash of her grey eyes, I am not to be played with by you, Soa. In this matter, the deliverer's interests are my interests and his ends are my ends. Together we stand or fall. Together we live or die. And that shall be an unhappy hour for you, Soa, when you attempt to desert or betray us. It is well, Shepherdess, she answered. Your will is my will, for I love you alone in the world, and all the rest I hate. And she glared at Leonard and Otter. You are my father and my mother and my child, and where you are, in life or in death, there is my home. Let us go, then, among this people of mine, there to perish miserably, so that the deliverer may seek to glut himself with wealth. Listen, this is the law of my people, or this was their law when I left them forty years ago, that every stranger who passed through their gates should be offered as a sacrifice to Akka, the mother, if the time of his coming should be in the summer, and to Yal, the sun, if the time of his coming be in winter. For the mist-dwellers do not love strangers. But there is a prophecy among my people which tells, when many generations have gone by, that Akka, the mother, and Yal, the sun, shall return to the land which once they ruled, clothed in the flesh of men. And the shape of Akka shall be such as shape as yours, shepherdess, and the shape of Yaw shall be as is the shape of this black dog of a dwarf, whom when I first saw him in my folly I deemed immortal and divine. Then the mother and the son shall rule in the land, and its kings shall cease from kingship, and the priests of the snake shall be their servants, and with them shall come peace and prosperity that do not pass away. Shepherdess, you know the tongue of the people of the mist, for when you were little I taught it to you, because to me it is the most beautiful of tongues. You know the song also, the holy song of re-arising, that shall be on the lips of Akka when she comes again, and which I, being the daughter of the high priest, learned with many another secret before I was doomed to be a bride to the snake and fled, fearing my doom. Now come apart with me, shepherdess, and you, black one, come also, that I may teach you your lesson of what you shall do when we meet the squadrons of the people of the mist. Juana rose to obey her, followed by Otter, grumbling, for he hated the old woman as much as she hated him, and moreover, he did not take kindly to this notion of masquerading as a god, or indeed to the prospect of a lengthened sojourn among his adoring. 
but from all accounts somewhat truculent worshippers. Before they went, however, Leonard spoke. I have heard you so, he said, and I do not like your words, for they show me that your heart is fierce and evil. Yes, though you love the shepherdess, your heart is evil. Now hear me. Should you dare to play us false, whatever may befall us, be sure of this. That moment you die. Go. Spare your threats, deliverer, answered Soa haughtily. I shall not betray you, because to do so would be to betray the shepherdess. But are you then a fool that you think I should fear death at your hands, who tomorrow, with a word, could give you all to torment? Pray, deliverer, that the hour may not be near, when you shall rejoice to die by the bullet with which you threatened me, so that you may escape worse things. And she turned and went. I am not nervous, said Leonard to Francisco, but that she-devil frightens me. If it were not for Juana, she would cause us to be murdered on the first possible opportunity, and if only she can secure her safety, I believe that she will do it yet. And I believe that she is a witch, Altram, answered the priest with fervor, a servant of the evil one, such as are written of in the scriptures. Last night, I saw her praying to her gods. She did not know that I was near, for the place was lonely. But I saw her, and I never wished to see anything so horrible again. I will tell you why she hates us all so much, Otram. She is jealous, because the Senora does not hate us. That woman's heart is wicked. Wickedness was born in her, yet, as none are altogether evil, she has one virtue her love of the senora. She is husbandless and childless, for even among the black people, as I have learnt from the settlement men, all have feared her and shrunk from her, notwithstanding her good looks. Therefore everything that is best in her has gone to nourish this love for the woman whom she nursed from a babe. It was because of her fierceness that the senior rude, who is dead, chose her for his daughter's nurse. When he found that her heart was hungry with love for the child, for he knew that she would die before she suffered harm to come to her. He showed good judgment there, said Leonard. Had it not been for Soa, Juana would have been a slave girl now, or dead. That is so, Autram. But whether we showed good judgment in trusting our lives to her tender mercies is quite another matter. Say, friend, do you think it well to go on with this business? Oh, confound it all, said Leonard with irritation. How can we turn back now? Just think of the journey, and how foolish we should look. Besides, we have none of us got anything to live upon. It took most of the gold that I had to bribe Peter and his men to accompany us. I dare say that we shall all be killed. That seems very probable, but for my part I really shan't be sorry. I am tired of life, Francisco. It is nothing but a struggle and a wretchedness. And I begin to feel that peace is all I can hope to win. I have done my best here, according to my lights, so I don't know why I should be afraid of the future, especially as it has been taken out of me pretty well in the present though of course I am afraid, for all that every man is. The only thing that troubles me is a doubt whether we ought to take Juana into such a place, but really I do not know, but it would be as dangerous to go back as to proceed. Those gentlemen with the poisoned arrows may have recovered from their fear of firearms by now. I wish we had nothing worse than the hereafter to fear, said Francisco, with a sigh. It is the journey thither that is so terrible. As for our expedition, having undertaken it, I think on the whole that we had better persevere, especially as the Senora wishes it, and she is very hard to turn. After all, our lives are in the hands of the Almighty, and therefore we shall be just as safe or unsafe among the people of the mist, as in a European city. 
those of us who are destined to live will live and those who hour is at hand must die and now good night for i'm going to sleep next morning shortly before dawn leonard was awakened by a hubbub among the natives and creeping out of his blankets he found that some of them who had been to the river to draw water had captured two bushmen belonging to a nomadic tribe that lived by spearing fish these wretched creatures notwithstanding the cold only wore a piece of bark tied round their shoulders were screaming with fright and it was not until they had been pacified by gifts of beads and empty brass cartridges that anything could be got out of them when confidence had at length been restored otter questioned them closely as to the country that lay beyond the wall of rock and the people who dwelt in it through one of the settlement men who spoke a language sufficiently like their own to make himself understood they replied that they had never been in that country themselves because they dared not go there but they had heard of it from others the land was very cold and foggy they said so foggy that sometimes people could not see each other for whole days and in it dwelt a race of great men covered with hair who sacrificed strangers to a snake which they worshipped and married all their fairest maidens to a god that was all they knew of the country and of the great men for few who visited there ever returned to tell tidings it was certainly a haunted land finding that there was no more to be learnt from the bushmen leonard suffered them to depart which they did at considerable speed and ordered the settlement men to make ready to march but now a fresh difficulty arose the interpreter had repeated all the bushman's story to his companions among whom it is needless to say it produced no small effect therefore when the bearers received their orders instead of striking the little tent in which juana slept and preparing their loads as usual after a brief consultation they advanced upon leonard in a body what is this peter he asked of the headman this deliverer we have travelled with you and the shepherdess for three full moons enduring much hardship and passing many dangers now we learn that there lies before us a land of cold and darkness inhabited by devils who worship a devil deliverer we have been good servants to you and we are not cowards as you know but it is true that we fear to enter this land what do you wish to do then peter asked leonard we wish to return whence we came deliverer already we have nearly earned the money that you gave us before we started and we will take no more pay if we must win it by crossing yonder wall the way back is far peter answered leonard and you know its perils how many think you will reach their homes alive if i am not there to guide them for no, Peter, I will not turn back now. Desert me, if you wish, all of you, and I still will enter this country alone, or with Otter only. Alone we took the slave camp, and alone we will visit the people of the mist. Your words are true, Deliverer, said Peter. The homeward way is far, and its perils many. Mayhap, but very few of us will live to see their huts again for this is an ill-fated journey but if we pass yonder and he pointed to the wall of rock then we shall all of us certainly die and be offered to a devil by devils leonard pulled his beard thoughtfully and said it seems there is nothing else to say peter except good-bye the headman saluted and was turning away with an abashed countenance when juana stopped him Together with Otter and the others, she had been listening to the colloquy in silence, and now spoke for the first time. Peter, she said gently, when you and your companions were in the hands of the Yellow Devil and about to be sold as slaves, who was it that rescued you? The Deliverer, Shepherdess. Yes, and now 
Do my ears betray me, or do I hear you say that you and your brethren, who, with many another, were saved from shame and toil by the Deliverer, are about to leave him in his hour of danger? You have heard aright, Shepherdess, the man answered sadly. It is well, Peter. Go, children of Mavoon, my father, who can desert me in my need. For learn, Peter, that where you fear to tread, there I, a white woman, will pass alone with the Deliverer. Go, children of my father, and may peace go with you. Yet, as you know, I, who foretold the doom of the Yellow Devil, am a true prophetess, and I tell you this, that but a very few of you shall live to see your corral again, and you will not be of their number, Peter. As for those who come home safely, their names shall be a mockery. The little children shall call them coward and traitor and jackal. And one by one they shall eat out their hearts and die, because they deserted him who saved them from the slave ship and the scourge. Farewell, children of my father. May peace go with you, and may his ghost not come to haunt you on your path. And with one indignant glance, she turned scornfully away. Brethren, said Peter, after a moment's pause, is it to be borne that the shepherdess should mock us thus and tie such ropes of shame about our necks? No, they answered, we cannot bear it. Then for a while they consulted together again, and presently Peter stood forward and said, Deliverer, we will accompany you and the shepherdess into the country of devils, nor need you fear that we shall desert or betray you. We know well that we go to our deaths, every one of us. Still it is better to die than to live bearing the burden of such bitter words as hide within the shepherdess lips. Very well, answered Leonard. Get your loads and let us start. Ay, it is well indeed, put in Otter, with a snort of indignation. I tell you this, Peter, that before you left this place, the words of the shepherdess had come true for you and for one or two others. For I should have fought you till I was killed, and though I have little wisdom yet, I know how to fight. Leonard smiled at the dwarf's rage, but his heart was heavy within him. He knew that these men had reason on their side, and he feared greatly lest their evil forebodings should come true and the lives of all of them pay forfeit for his rashness. But it was too late to turn back now. Things must befall as they were fated. End of chapter 18Of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The End of the Journey. An hour later, the party began the ascent of the wall of rock, which proved to be an even more difficult business than they had anticipated. There was no path for those who lived beyond this natural barrier, never came down it, and few of the dwellers in the plains had ever ventured to go up. It was possible, for Soa herself had descended here in bygone years, and this was all that could be said for it. In default of a better road they followed the course of the river, which thundered down the face of the precipice in four great waterfalls, connected by as many sullen pools, whose cavities had been hallowed out in the course of centuries from the rock. The second of these ledges proved so insurmountable that at one time Leonard thought that they would be obliged to abandon their attempt and follow the foot of the cliff till they found some easier route. But at last Otter, who could climb like a cat, succeeded in passing the most dangerous part at the risk of his life, bearing a rope with him by means of which the rest of the party and the loads of goods were hauled up one by one. It was evening before the height was scaled, and they proceeded to encamp upon its summit, making a scanty meal of some meat 
which they had brought with them. That night they passed in great discomfort, for it was midwinter, and here the climate proved to be very cold. Bitter winds swept across the vast plain before them and searched them through, all the clothing and blankets they had scarcely sufficing to keep them warm. Indeed, the settlement men and Francisco, who had been bred in a southern climate, suffered severely. Nor were matters improved when, on the breaking of the light, they woke from a troubled sleep to find the plain hidden in a dense mist. However, they rose, made a fire with reeds and dead wood which they gathered on the banks of the river, and ate, waiting for the fog to vanish. But it did not vanish, so about nine o'clock they continued their journey under Soa's guidance, following the east bank of the river northwards. The ground proved easy to travel over, for, with the exception of isolated water-worn boulders of granite, the plain was perfectly smooth and covered with turf as fine as any that grows in northern lands. All that day they marched on, wandering like ghosts through the mists, and guided in their path by the murmuring sound of the river. They met no man, but once or twice great herds of hairy creatures thundered past them. Leonard fired into one of these herds with an express rifle, for they wanted meat, and a prodigious snorting and bellowing told him that his shot had taken effect. Running to the spot whence the sounds came, he found a huge white bull kicking in its death struggle. The animal was covered with long white hair, like that of the British breed of wild cattle, and measured at least seventeen hands in height. Round it stood others snorting with fear and wonder that, when they saw Leonard, put down their heads threateningly, tearing up the turf with their great horns. He shouted aloud and fired another shot, whereupon they turned and disappeared into the mist. This happened towards nightfall, so they determined to camp upon the spot. But while they were engaged in skinning the bull, an incident occurred that did not tend to raise their spirits. At sunset the sky cleared a little. At least the sinking sun shone red through the mist, as it does in a London fog of the third density. Against this red ball of the sun, and some dozen yards away, suddenly there appeared the gigantic figure of a man, for unless the fog deceived them, he must have been between six and seven feet high, and broad in proportion. Of his face they could see nothing, but he was clad in goatskins and armed with a great spear and a bow slung upon his back. Juana was the first to see and point him out to Leonard, with a start of fear, as he stood watching them in solemn silence. Obeying the impulse of the moment, Leonard stepped forward towards the vision, holding his rifle ready. But before he reached the spot where it had stood, the figure vanished. Then he walked back again to Juana. I think we have heard so much of giants that we begin to believe we see them, he said, laughing. As he spoke, something clove the air between them and stuck in the earth beyond. They went to it. It was a large arrow, having a barbed point, and flighted with red feathers. That is a very tangible fancy at any rate, Juana answered, drawing the shaft out of the ground. We have had a narrow escape. Leonard did not speak, but raising his rifle, fired it at a venture in the direction whence the arrow had sped. Then he ran to put their little band in a position of defense, Juana following him but as it chanced, he might have spared himself the trouble, for nothing further happened, indeed. The net outward and visible result of this mysterious apparition was that they spent a miserable night, waiting in the fog and wet, for it had come on to rain, or rather drizzle, for an enemy who, in their intense relief, never appeared. But the inward and spiritual consequences were much greater, for now, they knew that Spoa spoke truth, and that the legend of the Bushmen as to the great men covered with hair was no mere savage invention. 
At last the morning came. It was damp and wretched, and they were all half starved with cold and oppressed by fears. Indeed, some of the settlement men were so terrified that they openly lamented having suffered their sense of shame and loyalty to overcome their determination to retreat. Now they could not do so, for the malcontents among them did not dare to retrace their steps alone. Moreover, Leonard spoke plainly on the matter, telling him that he would drive away the first man who attempted any insubordination. Soaked through, shivering, and miserable, they pursued their march across the unknown plain. Soa, who seemed to grow hourly grimmer, now that she was in her own country, stalking ahead of them as guide. It was warmer walking than sitting still, and in one respect their lot was better, for a little wind, stirring the mist from time to time, revealed gleams of the watery sun. All that day they journeyed on, seeing no more of the man who had shot the arrow or his fellows, till at length darkness drew near again. Then they halted, and Leonard and Otter walked to and fro, searching for a suitable place to make the camp and pitch their solitary tent. Presently Otter shouted aloud. Leonard ran towards him and found him staring into the mist at something that loomed largely about a hundred yards away. "'Look, boss,' he said, "'there's a house, a house of stone, with grass growing on the roof.' Nonsense, said Leonard. It must be some more boulders. However, we can soon find out. They crept cautiously towards the object that, as soon became evident, was a house, or a very good apology for one, built of huge, undressed boulders, bedded in turf by way of mortar, and roofed with the trunks of small trees, and a thick thatch of sods whereupon the grass grew green. This building may have measured forty feet in length by twenty in depth, and seventeen from the ground line to the wall plate. Also it had a doorway of remarkable height and two window places, but all these openings were unclosed except by curtains of hide which hung before them. Leonard called Soa and asked her what the place was. Doubtless the house of a herdsman, she answered, who was set here to watch the cattle of the king or of the priests. It may chance that this is the dwelling of that man who shot the arrow yesterday. Having assured themselves that here was a human habitation, it remained to be ascertained whether it was tenanted. After waiting a while, to see if any one passed in or out, Otter undertook this task. Going down on his hands and knees, he crept up to the wall, then along it to the doorway, and after listening there a while, he lifted a corner of the hide curtain and peeped into the interior. Presently he rose, saying, All right, boss, the place is empty. They both entered and examined the dwelling with curiosity. It was rude enough. The walls were unplastered, and the damp streamed down them. The floor was of trodden mud, and a hole in the roof served as a chimney. But by way of compensation, the internal space was divided into two apartments, one of them a living room and the other a sleeping chamber. It was evident that the place had not been long deserted, for the fire still smoldered on the hearth, round which stood various earthen cooking dishes, and in the sleeping room was a rough bedstead of wood, whereupon lay wrappings made from the hides of cattle and goats. When they had seen everything there was to be seen, they hurried back to the others to report their discovery. And just then the rain set in more heavily than before. A house, said Juana. Then for goodness sakes let's get into it. We're all half dead with the cold and wet. Yes, answered Leonard. I think we had better take possession, though it may be a little awkward if the rightful owner comes back. The best that can be said for the night which they spent in this stone shanty, undisturbed by any visit from its lawful tenant, is that it passed the shade more comfortably than it would have done outside. 
They were dry, though the place was damp, and they had a fire. Still, until you are used to it, it is trying to sit in the company of a score of black people and of many thousand fleas, enveloped with a cloud of pungent smoke, according to the custom of our Norse ancestors. So Juanna gave up the attempt and retired to the great bed in the inner chamber, wondering much who had occupied it last. A herdsman, she judged, as Soa had suggested, for in the corner of the room stood an ox goad, hugely fashioned. But it was a bed, and she slept as soundly in it as its numerous insect occupants would allow. The others were not so fortunate. They had the insects indeed, but no bed. Again the morning came, wet, miserable, and misty, and through the mist and rain they pursued their course, whither they knew not. All day they wandered on by the banks of the river till night fell and they camped, this time without shelter. Now they had reached the extreme of wretchedness, for they had little or no food left and could not find fuel to make a fire. Leonard took Soa aside and questioned her, for he saw clearly that a couple more days of this suffering would put an end to all of them. You say these people of yours have a city, Soa? They have a city, Deliverer, she answered, but whether they will allow you to enter it, except as a victim for sacrifice, is another matter. None of us will enter it, unless we find shelter soon, he answered. How far is the place away? It should be a day's journey, Deliverer. Were the mist gone, you could see it now. The city is built at the foot of great mountains. There are none higher, but the fog hides everything. Tomorrow, if it lifts, you will see that I speak truth. Are there any houses near where we can shelter? he asked again. How can I tell? she answered. It is forty years since I passed this road, and here, where the land is barren, none dwell except the herdsmen. Perhaps there is a house at hand, or perhaps there is none for many miles. Who can say? Finding that Soa could give no further information, Leonard returned to the others, and they huddled themselves together for warmth on the wet ground as best they might, and sat out the hours in silence, not attempting to sleep. The settlement men were numb with cold, and Juana also was overcome for the first time, though she tried hard to be cheerful. Francisco and Leonard heaped their own blankets on her, pretending that they had found spare ones, but the wraps were wringing wet and gave her little comfort. Soa alone did not appear to suffer, perhaps because it was her native climate, and Otter kept his spirits, which neither heat nor cold nor hunger seemed to affect. While my heart is warm, I am warm, he said cheerfully, when Leonard asked him how he fared. As for Leonard himself, he sat silent, listening to the moans of the settlement men, and reflecting that twenty-four hours more of this misery would bring the troubles of most of them to an end. Without food or shelter, it was very certain that few of those alive tonight would live to see a second dawn. At last the light came, and to their wonder and exceeding joy they found that the rain had ceased and the mist was melting. Once more they beheld the face of the sun, and rejoiced in its warmth, as only those can rejoice, who for days and nights have lived in semi-darkness, wet to the skin, and frozen to the marrow. The worst of the mist was gone indeed, but it was not until they had breakfasted off a buck which otter shot in the reeds by the river that the lingering veils of vapor withdrew themselves from the more distant landscape. At last they had vanished, and for the first time the wanderers saw the land through which they were traveling. They stood upon a vast plain that sloped upwards gradually till it ended at the foot of a mighty range of snow-capped mountains named, as they learned in after days, the Bina Mountains. This range was shaped like a half-moon, or a bent bow, 
and the nearest point of the curve, formed by a soaring snowy peak, was exactly opposite to them, and to all appearance not more than five and twenty miles away. On either side of this peak the unbroken line of mountains receded with a vast and majestic sweep till the eye could follow them no more. The plain about them was barren, and everywhere strewn with granite boulders, between which wandered herds of wild cattle, mixed with groups of antelopes. But the lower slopes of the mountains were clothed with dense juniper forests, and among them were clearings, presumably of cultivated land. Otter searched the scene with his eyes that were as those of a hawk, then said quietly, Look yonder, boss. The old hag has not lied to us. There is the city of the people of the mist. Following the line of the dwarf's outstretched hand, Leonard saw what had at first escaped him, that standing back in a wide bend at the foot of the great mountain, in front of them were a multitude of houses, built of grey stone and roofed with green turf. Indeed, had not his attention been called to it, the town might have well missed observation until he was quite close to its walls, for the materials of which it was constructed resembled those of the boulders that lay about them in the thousands, and the vivid green of its roofs gave it the appearance of a distant space of grassy land. Yes, there is the corral of the great people, said Otter again, and it is a strong corral. See, boss, they know how to defend themselves. The mountain is behind them that none can climb, and all around their walls the river runs, joining itself together again on the plain beyond. It would go ill with the impi which tried to take the corral. For a while they all stood still and stared amazed. It seemed strange that they should have reached this fable city, and now that they were there, how would they be received within its walls? This was the question which each one of them was asking of himself. There was but one way to find out. They must go and see. No retreat was now possible. Even the settlement people felt this. Better to die at the hands of the great men, said one of them aloud, than to perish miserably in the mist and cold. Be of good cheer, Leonard answered. You are not yet dead. The sun shines once more. It is a happy omen. When they had rested and dried their clothes, they marched on with a certain sense of relief. There before them was the goal they had traveled so far to win. Soon they would know the worst that could befall, and anything was better than this long suspense. By midday they had covered about fifteen miles of ground, and could now see the city clearly. It was a great town, surrounded by a cyclopean wall of boulders, about which the river ran on every side, forming a natural moat. The buildings within the wall seemed to be arranged in streets, and to be built on a plan similar to that of the house in which they had slept two nights before. The vast conglomeration of grass-covered roofs giving the city the appearance of a broken field of turf hillocks supported upon walls of stone. For the rest, the place was laid out upon a slope, and at its head, immediately beneath the sheer steps of the mountainside, stood two edifices, very much larger in size than any of those below. One of these resembled the other houses in construction, and was surrounded by a separate enclosure but the second, which was placed on higher ground, so far as they could judge at that distance, was roofless, and had all the characteristics of a Roman amphitheater. At the far end of this amphitheater stood a huge mass of polished rock, bearing a grotesque resemblance to the figure of a man. "'What are those buildings, Soa?' asked Leonard. "'The lower one is the house of the king, white man, and that above is the temple of deep waters, where the river rises from the bowels of the mountain. And what is that black stone beyond the temple? That white man 
is the statue of the god who sits there forever, watching over the city of his people. He must be a great god, said Leonard, alluding to the size of the statue. He is great, she answered, and my heart is afraid at the sight of him. After resting for two hours they marched on again, and soon it became apparent that their movements were watched. The roadway, which they were following, if a track beaten flat by feet of men and cattle could be called a road, wound to and fro between the boulders of rock, and here and there, standing upon the boulders, were men clad in goat skins, each of them carrying a spear, a bow, and a horn. So soon as their party came within five or six hundred yards of one of these men, he would shoot an arrow in their direction, which, when picked up, proved to be barbed with iron, and flighted with red feathers, like the first one that they had seen. Then the sentry would blow his horn, either as a signal or in token of defiance, bound from the rock, and vanish. This did not look encouraging, but there was worse to come. Presently, as they drew near to the city, they descried large bodies of armed men crossing the river that surrounded it in boats and on rafts, and mustering on the hither side. At length all of them were across, and the regiment, which appeared to number more than a thousand men, formed up in a hollow square and advanced upon them at the double. The crisis was at hand. End of chapter 19 of the people of the mist by h rider haggard this librivox recording is in the public domain the coming of akka leonard turned and looked at his companions with something like dismay written on his face what is to be done now he said we must wait for them until they come near answered juana then otter and i are to meet them alone and i will sing the song which soa has taught me do not be afraid. I have learned my lesson, and if things go right, they will think that we are their lost gods, or at least so Soa says. Yes, if things go right, but if they don't? Then good-bye, answered Juana, with a shrug of her shoulders. At any rate, I must get ready for the experiment. Come, Soa, bring the bundle to those rocks over there quick. Stop a minute. I forgot. Mr. Ultram. You must lend me that ruby. I have to make use of it. Leonard handed over the ruby, reflecting that he would probably never see it again, since it seemed almost certain that one of the great people would steal it. However, at the moment, he was thinking of that which was far above rubies, namely, of what chance they had of escaping with their lives. So soon as she had possession of the stone, Juana ran to the little ring of boulders that were scattered on the plain about fifty paces from them, followed by Soa, who carried a bundle in her hand. Ten minutes passed, and Soa appeared from behind the shelter of the stones and beckoned to them. Advancing in obedience to her summons, they saw a curious sight. Standing in the ring of rocks was Juana, but Juana transformed. She wore a white robe cut low upon the neck and shoulders. Indeed, it was the Arab dress in which she had escaped from the slave camp that Soa had brought with them in preparation for this moment of trial. Nor was this all, for Juana had loosened her dark hair, which was of great length and unusual beauty, so that it hung about her almost to her knees, and upon her forehead, gleaming like a red eye, was set the great ruby, ingeniously fastened thereto by Soa, in a band of linen pierced in its center to the size of the stone. Behold the goddess, and do homage, said Juana with mock solemnity, although Leonard could see that she was trembling with excitement. I do not quite understand what you are going to do, but you look the part well, he answered shortly, and indeed until that moment he had never known how beautiful she was. 
Juana blushed a little at the evident admiration in his eyes. Then, turning to the dwarf, she said, Now, Otter, you must make ready, too, and remember what Soa told you. Whatever you see or hear, you are not to open your mouth. Walk side by side with me, and do as I do. That is all. Otter grunted in assent, and proceeded to make ready. The process was simple, consisting only in the shedding of his coat and trousers, an old pair of Leonard's very much cut down, which left him naked except for a mocha that he wore beneath them in accordance with native custom. "'What does all this mean?' asked the headman Peter, who, like his companions, was trembling with fear. "'It means,' said Juana, "'that Otter and I are impersonating the gods of this people. Peter, if they receive us as gods, it is well. If not, we are doomed. Be careful. Should we be so received, least any of you betray the trick. Be wise and silent, I say, and do what we shall tell you from time to time, if you would live to look upon the sun. Peter fell back astonished, while Leonard and Francisco turned their attention to the approaching soldiers of the people of the mist. They advanced slowly and in silence, but their measured tread shook the earth. At last they halted about a hundred and fifty yards away, presenting a truly terrifying spectacle to the little band among the rocks. So far as Leonard could see, there was not a man among them who stood less than six feet in height, and they were broad in proportion, hugely made. In appearance, they were neither handsome nor repulsive, but solemn-looking, large-eyed, thick-haired, between black and yellow in hue, and wearing an expression of dreadful calm, like the calm of an archaic statue. For the rest, they seemed to be well disciplined, each company being under the command of a captain, who, in addition to his arms, carried a trumpet fashioned from a wild bull's horn. The regiment stood silent, gazing at the group of strangers, or rather, at the boulders behind which they were concealed. In the center of their hollow square was a knot of men, one of them young and huge, even in comparison with his companions. This man Leonard took to be a chief or king. Behind were orderlies and counselors, and before him three aged persons of stately appearance and a cruel cast of countenance. These men were naked to the waist and unarmed, except for a knife or hanger fixed at the girdle. On their broad breasts, covering more than half the skin surface, the head of a huge snake was tattooed in vivid blue. Evidently, they were medicine men or priests. While the adventurers watched and wondered, the king or chief issued an order to his attendants who ran to the corners of the square and called it aloud. Then he raised his great spear, and every captain blew upon his horn, making a deafening sound. Now the enemy stood still for a while, staring towards the stones, and the three medicine men drew near to the chief, in the center of the square, and talked with him, as though debating what should be done. "'This is our chance,' said Juana excitedly. "'If once they attack us, it will be all over. A single volley of arrows would kill every one of us. Come, Otter. No, no, said Leonard. I am afraid of you venturing yourself among those savages. The danger is too great. Danger? Can the danger be more than it is here? In a minute we may all be dead. Nonsense, I will go. I know what to do, and have made up my mind to do it. Do not fear for me. Remember that. If the worst comes to the worst, I have means to protect myself. You are not afraid to come, are you, Otter? No, Shepherdess, said the dwarf. Here all roads are alike. Leonard thought a while. Bitterly did he reproach himself in that he had been the cause of leading his ward into such a position, but now there was no help for it. She must go. After all, it could make no difference if she were killed or captured five minutes hence, or half an hour later. But Francisco, who could not take such a philosophical view of the situation, implored her 
not to venture herself alone among those horrible savages. "'Go if you like, Juana,' said Leonard, not heeding the priest's importunities. "'If anything happens, I will try to avenge you before I follow. Go, but forgive me.' "'What have I to forgive?' she said, looking at him with shining eyes. "'Did you not once dare a greater danger for me?' "'Yes, go, shepherdess,' said Soa, who till now had been staring with all her eyes at the three aged men in the center of the square. "'There is little to fear, if this fool of a dwarf will but keep his tongue silent. I know my people, and I tell you that if you sing that song and say the words which I have taught you, you and the black one here shall be proclaimed gods of the land. But be swift, for the soldiers are about to shoot.' As Soa spoke, Leonard saw the conference in the square had come to an end. The messengers were calling commands to the captains, which the captains repeated to the soldiers, and then followed a mighty rattling of quivers. Another instant, and the light shone upon many hundreds of arrowheads, every one of which was pointed toward them. Juana saw also, and springing forward on to a rock, stood there for a moment in the full glare of the sun. Instantly a murmur went up from the host. A great voice called a command. The barbs of steel flickered like innumerable stars and sank downwards. Now Otter, naked except for his mucha, sprang onto the rock by Juana's side, and the murmur of the soldiers of the great people grew into a hoarse roar of astonishment and dismay. Wonder had turned to fear, though why this multitude of warriors should fear a lovely white girl and a black dwarf was not apparent. For a moment the ill-assorted pair stood together on the rock. Then Juana leapt to the plain, Otter following her. For twenty yards or so she walked in silence, holding the dwarf by the hand, then suddenly bursting into singing, wild and sweet. This was a refrain of the sacred song which she sang in the ancient language of the people of the mist, the tongue that Soa had taught her as a child. I do but sleep. Have you wept for me a while? Hush! I did but sleep. I shall awake my people. I am not dead, nor can I ever die. See, I have but slept. See, I come again, made beautiful. Have you not seen me in the faces of the children? Have you not heard me in the voices of the children? Look on me now, the sleeper arisen. Look on me, who wandered, whose name is the dawning. Why have you mourned me, the sleeper awakened? Then she sang, even more sweetly and louder, till her voice rang through the still air like the song of a bird in winter. Hushed were the companies of the great men, as she drew towards them with slow, gliding steps, hushed with fear and wonder, as though her presence awoke a memory or fulfilled a promise. She was in front of their foremost rank, and halting there, was silent for a moment. Then she changed her song. Will ye not greet me, children of my children? Have ye forgotten the promise of the dead? Shall I return to the dreamland whence I wander? Will ye refuse me, the mother of the snake? The soldiers looked upon one another, and murmured to each other. Now she saw that they understood her words, and were terror-stricken by them. For another moment there was silence, then suddenly the three priests, or medicine men, who had drawn near together, passed through the ranks, and stood before her, accompanied by the warrior chief. Then one of them, the most aged, a man who must have numbered ninety years, spoke in the midst of an intense silence. To Juana's joy, as they had understood her, so she understood him, for his language was the same that Soa had taught her many years before, and in which, for the sake of practice, they had always conversed together for the last two months. "'Art thou woman or spirit?' asked the ancient priest. I am both woman and spirit, she answered. And he with thee, he, whom we know of, 
went on the priest, pointing trembling to Otter. Is he God or man? He is both God and man, she answered. And those yonder, who are they? They are our ministers and servants, white for the white and black for the black, the companions of our wanderings, men and not spirits. The three priests consulted together, while the chief looked on Juana's beauty with wandering eyes. Then the oldest of them spoke again. Thou tellest in our own tongue of things that have long been hidden, though perchance they are remembered. Either, O oh beautiful, thou hast learned these things and lies to us, and then food ye are for the snake, against whom thou dost blaspheme. Or ye are gods indeed, and as gods ye shall be worshipped. Tell us now thy name, and the name of yonder dwarf, of whom we know. I am named the Shepherdess of Heaven among men. His name is Otter, Dweller in the Waters, among men. Once we had other names. Tell us the other names, O Shepherdess. Once in the far past I was named Brightness. I was named Dawn. I was named Daylight. Once in the far past he was named Silence. He was named Terror. He was named Darkness. Yet at the beginning we had other names. Perchance you know them, ministers of the snake. Perchance we know them. O thou who art named Shepherdess of Heaven, O thou who wert named Brightness, and Dawn, and Daylight, O thou who art named Dweller in the Waters, and wert named Silence, and Terror, and Darkness, perchance we know them, although they be known to few, and never spoken, save in utter gloom and with hidden head. But do ye know them, those names of the beginning? For if ye know them not, O beautiful, ye lie, and you blaspheme, and you are food for the snake. Seldom through all the years have those holy names been spoken, save in utter darkness and with covered heads, Juana answered boldly. But now is the new hour, the hour of the coming, and now they should be called aloud, in the light of day, from open lips and with uplifted eyes. Hearken, children of the snake, these are the names by which we were known in the beginning. Akka is my name, the mother of the snake. Yal is he named, who is the snake. Say, do ye know us now? As these words rang on her lips, a groan of terror burst from every man who heard them. Then the aged priest cried aloud, down on your faces, ye children of the snake, worship, all ye people of the spear, dwellers in the mist. Akka, the queen immortal, has come home again. Yal, the god, has put on the flesh of men. Olfen, lay down thy kingship. It is his, ye priests, throw wide the temples, they are theirs. Worship the mother, do honor to the god. The multitude heard and prostrated themselves like a single man, every one of them crying in a shout of thunder. Akka, the queen of life, has come. Yaol, the doom god, has put on flesh. Worship the mother, do honor to the god. It was as though the army had suddenly been smitten with death, and of the hundreds there, Juana and Otter alone were left standing. There was one exception, however and that was Olfen, the warrior chief, who remained upon his feet, not seeming to relish the command to abdicate his authority thus brusquely in favor of a dwarf, were he god or man. Otter, who was utterly bewildered, not comprehending a word of what had been said, and being unable to phantom the meaning of these strange antics, pointed at the chief with his spear, by way of calling Wada's attention to the fact that he was still standing. But the great man interpreted the action otherwise. Evidently, he thought that the newly arrived god was invoking destruction on him. His pride yielded to his superstition, and he sank to his knees also. When the sound of the worshipping had passed away, Juana spoke again, addressing the old priest. "'Rise, my children,' she said. He might as well have been her great-grandfather. And rise, all ye, 
soldiers of the spear, and servants of the snake, and hear my words. You know me now. You know me by the holy name. You know me by the fashion of my face, and by the red stone that gleams upon my brow. In the beginning my blood fell yonder, and was frozen into such gems as these, which today ye offer yearly to him who is my child and slew me. Now the fate is accomplished, and his reign is finished. I come with him indeed, and he is still a god, but he loves me as a son again, and bows the knee to me in service. Enough, ye who know the ancient tale that is fulfilled this day. Now we pass on towards our city, there to sojourn with you a while, and to proclaim the law of the ending, and we shall pass alone. There in our city let a place be made ready for us, a place apart but nigh to the temple, and let food be brought to that place, that my servants may eat. At the gate of the city also let men be waiting to bear us to that dwelling. Let none spy upon us, lest an evil fate attend you all. And let none be disobedient, lest we pass from you back to the land of death and dreams. Perchance we shall not tarry here for long. Perchance we come to bring a blessing and to depart again. Therefore hasten to do our bidding, and do it all. For this time farewell, my servants. Having spoken thus with much dignity, accompanied by Otter, whose hand she held as before, Juana withdrew herself, stepping backwards very slowly toward the circle of the rocks and singing as she went. End of chapter 20